Well, thanks for making it out in the, uh, the weather. It's melted off, but appreciate having a crowd. After last week, didn't do too well with that one. Um, what I was going to do today is kind of, this is more or less a state of the nation address, if you will, for the geology. Um, the, um, the talk, um, you know, a lot, lot of people here have employed the site, so I'm going to repeat things that a lot of people already know. Um, I'm trying to accommodate, you know, the public coming in as well. So there's, there'll be a combination of things. I'll apologise if I repeat and say some of the things that are more obvious that people already know. So, um, all right. So one thing you already know since you're here, we already have established where the Great Fossil Site is. Right. But it's, you know, it's smack in the middle of East Tennessee here. Um, this is a, the recent satellite image off Google Earth, of course. What else would you do without Google Earth these days? Um, just to give you an idea of the spread of the site now. Um, again, just to orient yourselves, there's the building we're currently in, there's the annex, uh, working on the site, mostly in this area in here. Why bother with this site? Because it's got bones in it. All right. Uh, uh, and again, um, a large number of, of uh, vertebrates been recovered from the site. Uh, again, most folks know what we're getting out of here. Um, the, uh, of course, um, the site's just really cool because it has such a good assemblage of vertebrates. And in addition, um, as the talk goes on, I'll make the point here, yeah, we've got the um, plant material as well and some inverts as well. Um, so it is a spectacular site. All right. Um, again, assuming that a few people may not have been by the site before, um, some of the, the cooler things that show up, we've got Tiliosaurus. Okay, yeah. That, that's actually not a, that's not projecting. It's not projecting enough and I'm not doing good enough. Okay. So, um, again, two of the more important vertebrates for the site, of course, is Tiliosaurus and Plyonarctos. Um, put these two together um, and we get an age constraint for the site for the vertebrates. Um, and the age is coming in at Pliomyocene, right? Basically in about seven and a half to five million years, give or take. Is everybody here in the back okay? Okay, cool. All right. Um, then, of course, you know, some of the other cool things. We have the red panda coming out of the site. Uh, not only is it cute, it also has Asian affinity, which makes it very interesting one way or another. And, again, other things we're getting out of the site. Um, you know, reptiles, so we've got turtles, we've got the alligator. Right. Uh, we also have some insects. This was recovered by folks on the other side of the fence, which is now down. Um, way back, Paul Flam was a student actually with my wife way back and then uh, went commercial um, and when the Fulkersons decided to have the Fulkerson Farm Institute they were quarrying um, on the other side of the fence down the hill a little bit um, and this is one of the things they came across. Um, I have no idea what happened to this if anybody's about to ask uh, which, which is too bad um, but they also produced a large number of leaf fossils out of there and um, again, we see similar leaves on this side of the fence, but they actually produce some quite nice ones. Um, uh, again, Paul Flam was a student with my wife, so we hung with Paul a little bit in the early days. Um, other than that, the politics were a little bit difficult, so we don't know what happened. These were available on eBay at one point. Right. So, uh, not so sure the Fulkersons were really all that worried about the academics, what they wanted to do, or the research. The, their aim, I think, at the time was to try to encourage the state to deal with them over the land. And of course, now we finally got to that point. It just took a few years to, to, to get there. Um, more recently, uh, Diana Ochoa, um, some people might remember Diana, right? Little fireball, right? Um, she worked on the pollen from the site uh, from the pits. Right, so the shallow recovery. Um, she uh, got a large amount of pollen out of it um, by working pretty hard for it because there wasn't the very high concentrations. But the bottom line is that she got a lot of oak, hickory and pine out of, out of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, samples from the pit. Um, she also recovered quite a few other things. Um, and this is the highlights, if you will, from Deanna's research. Um, which you know, runs pretty well with what we saw with the macro material as well. Um, so she had 47 samples out of six pits eventually. Uh, Myopliocene uh, age for the pollen uh, based on Terracaria. 
Um, low yield, 1,400 grains per gram. Um, and that's, uh, to put that in perspective, uh, I worked on pollen when I was way, 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 way back um, on brown coal seams. Um, and I would have uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of grains per gram in some of mine. Some of the coals I worked on were basically pure pollen. Um, so why the limit? Uh, loss of the material by, by oxidation. Um, there was a suggestion of uh, differences in the chemistry in the water might have affected that. Um, indications of drought that may have happened at the site. Uh, indications of fire. Uh, the main indication of fire down the list here is charcoal was right there as well. Um, basically, the identification of the assemblage or you know what the forest looked like was again oak, hickory, pine successional assemblage, which means that it was an evolved assemblage, um, and it had undergone changes because of fire, drought, and so on, and perhaps mega herbivore influence. Right, we have a gomphothere theory at the site. Does everybody know what a gomphothere theory is? Right, okay. So a large bulldozer on four legs, basically. Right, so these things, elephants still modify right, African savannah to the same effect. They knock down forests and open up things. And so the suggestion was that perhaps that was another control here. Um, Mike Zavada was looking at false growth rings in some of the wood recovered from the site, uh, indicating perhaps drought um, and I'm going to tell you that we have sediment influx events um, that we see in the sedimentation that occurred in the site. Um, and that would suggest that we're changing the ground cover a little bit, allowing erosion rates to, to vary a little. Um, and so it's another suggestion that maybe fire was controlling that. All right. Um, for the most part, the taxes that were showing up were required a, a frost-free environment. So the implications, we have warmer temperatures going on for uh, the deposition of these sediments at that time. Um, and also we have Asiatic affinities in the plants as well as right, with the vertebrates. Right, put all that together. Um, this is a slightly different time scale, but I wanted to throw it out. Um, just to say, here's the age of the grey fossil site. It's very young compared to everything else in our part of the world, and I'm going to throw that out um, quite a bit. Um, eventually, I'll be showing you more time scales. The local rocks around here are all around this age. So there's a huge difference in these things. Right. Because of its age, right, and we're in the Appalachians, here's our grey fossil site. This is a map um, done by Woodburn, um, and it's basically showing myopliocene vertebrate sites found across North America. The only thing I don't like is like you've got lots of sites, but you've got this whole thing all, all joined up. And there's almost an implication that's one band, you could just go mine it anywhere you want to. Of course, that's not the case. But the interesting thing is, the take home message, the Great Fossil Site is isolated, it's by itself. So it's a very unusual assemblage, it's an unusual location, and this is why this is so special, and this is why we're in this building, basically. All right, um, now the history lesson. Well, I'm going to go back to the beginning. Right, so, um, do, does everybody know the story of why the fossil site was found? So I assume most people do. Okay, so we have Boone High School behind us here. Um, I-75 had a curve in it. There was a road coming down here, which is Fulkerson Road, named for the Fulkerson family who own most of the real estate behind us here. Um, students, I guess it was traditional to come out at three o'clock and wreck on the corner here. Um, and so uh, TDOT decided to straighten out the road. And in the process of starting the bulldozing work, um, they started to uncover this black clay. Um, and ultimately that also had bone in it. And so they realized that they had a fossil site of some interest. Um, so this photo was one of the earliest ones I know of that exists for the site, 2001. Um, the red orange clay is the standard regulation clay that we see in much of the area around here. There's quite a bit of it around. Um, for whatever it's worth, this dark stuff here is filled from there. So there's probably bone down in that too, on the other side of that tree. All right. Um, once the bone was found, TDOT came in um, and it was decided to keep the site. Um, and TDOT really wanted to figure out, well, how much real estate do we need to keep? And so this is their map. And each one of these little pluses here marks where they drilled 
um, to see what they would hit. And basically they were looking for the black clay as they call it. Right. And so this is um, a random set of holes. They really didn't um, have a, a huge plan on how to do this systematically. It had to be quick and dirty basically when they did it. Um, obviously what they did is they kept the rig where the road was, gave them easy access, right? That's the short and sweet of that. So lots of line, uh, drills along Fulkerson Road, lots along 75. Um, they really got interested in going out here and they poked around there quite a bit and actually didn't get too much. Um, they didn't keep anything they, they uh, drilled for. This was a corkscrew style rig, if you will. It brought the clay up. All they were interested in what color the clay was coming up. So there are logs I've got for these things. Um, they report the clay either as lake sediment, uh, one or two places. Um, they try to call it a, a, a lignite, a poor quality coal, because there's so much wood coming up with it as well. So uh, anyway, so that was the only real record uh, that showed us the distribution of the site from this period of time. So based on that, quick and dirty, draw a circle around it. And this basically, I doodle this on the current satellite image to give you a better idea, but basically that, that's what TDOT determined the site to be. Um, they attempted to drill down to basement, which means they tried to drill until the drill bit stopped. Right? These corkscrew drill bits will only do clay and dirt, if you will. They don't do rock. And so they drilled down to what's called refusal. Right? And um, they made that in several uh, cases. In other cases, um, there were one or two cases that they uh, just hit a rock. And, um, and I'm going to say that they didn't get to the bottom. What happened is they hit a bloody great boulder, right? And then stopped there. Uh, most of the time they realized that and they would move the drill rig over and drill again and hope they would miss it this time. Um, and, um, you know, that was their idea of, of basically getting a, a figure for, you know, an idea of how deep the site was going to be. There was only one situation where they drilled down and they had to stop because they didn't have enough drill pipe to go to the distance. Right. So the deepest holes they have are in the order of about 40 metres deep. So you know, 120 feet for people who don't do metric, give or take. All right. Um, the rest of the story after that, once TDOT identified this, um, again, they decided to, now the site was just too important not to preserve. So uh, 75 was diverted around it. Um, and we went on from there. So the, uh, the buildings is along the line of the old road, basically, right? And for better or for worse, the buildings are literally on the site, right? It is interesting to talk to one of the engineers when they were first looking at this, to put a road there, um, they had caught into the grey clay. Um, and they, there was some discussion about whether the clay was mechanically strong enough to support a road. And then they said, well, what the hell, we'll put an $8 million building on it instead. So um, we'll see how that one plays out. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. It would have been much better if the site had been up over here and off the site material. And that's just the way it is, unfortunately. Right, this is the surface geology of the site. Again, uh, relatively quick and dirty. Um, the, the blue material is the fossil bearing right, material. So that's our grey and black clays. Um, there are gravels on top in a few places. These things are uh, blocks of rock. Um, there are brecciae or strewn fields across the site in several places. We came across one when the, this building's foundations were being dug. Uh, most of you are familiar with the one out at the Rhino Pit as well. Um, what's this one here? Am I recognise that guy? All right, that's the one I termed the bloody great boulder. All right, and it's the big one. All right, and. Um, there's uh, overlying sediment, some of it's just oxidised of the black clay and some of it's transitional into the gravels above. Don't know what the age of the gravels above are, but they could be very, very young. Right? They are important because without those we wouldn't have the site. Alright, um, right, this goes back in time too. Some of you may not have met Bristol. Bristol was, was working at the site. He was a uh, instructor in the uh, geology program um, and a, a full-on character in his own right and of course the red panda was named after him so we have a Bristol eye in the picture. Um, what I wanted you to see in this is that yeah here's our large boulder for um, basically put this in context we have these well laminated clays 
Um, and I'm using the term clay loosely here because most people call it clay. It actually is fine silt and clays. All right, when we get to it. Um, and then in the background, we have some of the overlying gravels. And I'm going to show you a few pictures from different orientations. And again, most of this won't be news to anybody. Um, one fun thing with the boulder, when you do look at these nicely laminated clays, there's some pressure on the top. It's very clear this boulder dropped down and squished. That's the, that's the scientific term for the day, right? The clay underneath, right? So we have deformation of this material, right? One way or another. Um, this boulder is in the middle of the size we have here now. How did it get here is one of the interesting questions, right? So we're talking about eagles with an attitude, dropping them, right? <laughs> oh, we are talking about very, very steep walls and a much, much higher feature than currently exists. Right, so if you do the math on the coring and what we can see on the surface above where they cored, we have about 12 metres of exposure above right, the lowest point on the site. So if you're being generous, we're talking about 50 metres of existing sediment in the site. Um, this had to have come from a, a, you know, a good height. So what I'm saying is that we had a much, much higher feature here at some point. Right. So um, and. No evidence this rolled in, it had to have dropped relatively vertically, so we're talking very steep walls as well for the nature of what we're going to call a sinkhole in a little bit. All right, I'm really making uh, use of, of Bristol. Um, the site sediments are very well laminated. Typically when people see very fine clays and well laminated things, one of the go-to depositional environments is a lake, and it makes perfect sense that this is a sinkhole lake fill. Um, Another possible question is, are they valves? Um, and a valve is an annual depositional cycle sedimentary deposit. Right? By definition, you have to have something repeating, and typically it's climatic or weather change, that, I'm sorry, climate change or seasonal change that's going to change, um, make these uh, deposits repeat over and over. The classic place to see valves is in glacial deposits. We have a glacial lake, it freezes over, uh, change the sedimentation, it kills off what was, was in the lake, you get a dark layer, then the next spring you'll have a flood of sediment, it will give you a light layer and you'll get repeating right, couplets of sediment right, coming in. We have repeating couplets here. Right? What we don't have is enough time control to know that these things are happening every year and valves by definition are yearly right, deposits. Right? So if you call them valves loosely, someone's going to come after you and argue. Right about that, and you know that's one of the biggest problems we have with these things. A lot of the valves, when you look at the core, and you'll see some pictures in a minute, are in the uh, millimetre to sub-millimetre range. They are very fine, so whatever's happening is repeating over and over and over again, a lot. Um, I'll leave it for that for the moment. Okay. Um, this is a topographic map of the site. Uh, it's colour coded. Um, this was done basically as a prelim to doing some additional work using gravity survey at the site. Um, the bottom line, reds are high points um, and uh, the greens are the, the lower points. So this is a tr the trace of Fulkerson Road would be coming through here and this is uh, 75. These lines, if people are wondering, uh, uh, some uh, gravity lines um, that were done basically cross sections to try to get a, an idea of what the structure would look like underneath. And I'll get back to those in a little bit. Again, just to, so to tie this map to the real world, um, this red point here, of course, is my favourite little hill, right? And um, um, a lot of people don't like it because it's just out there in the middle of everything. It's a little bit of an eyesore, but it does preserve the stratigraphy on that side of the site. So if anybody goes out there, I'll be lying in front of the bulldozer and doing that sort of thing, right? It's, it's sort of important to keep. Um, and we have the low point. Again, this is that large boulder that we keep going back to. If you look in the other direction, um, this is a very old picture, it's not the greatest quality, but it does show what was happening when the site was first found, so I like to keep it in. Um, and uh, again, the, this is our boulder, this, the, the um, T-dot um, went in with a backhoe and chewed a bit of a trench in there and tried to bench it to see what was going on on that side to get an idea of the stratigraphy there as well. So um, this is the big hill churches on the other side of the property. Amen. Yeah. So it's not known, it's assumed, right? And so, um, yeah. 
So I think you'd, it's fair to say that we have an erosional surface between that and the sinkhole fill, but whatever that age difference is, you're right, it's, it's, it's not a fair call. This is a uh, generic uh, cross uh, stratigraphic column for the site. So here's our gravels on top. Uh, we have uh, obliterated beds. Uh, and what, what that's alluding to is the fact that there's oxidation of those beds and the bed uh, structure's been destroyed. So it's, it's a, just a weathering issue effectively. And you get down a little bit further and you start to see these laminations very well preserved. Occasionally there are gravel stringers that go across the site and we also have these um, boulders that also um, make strewn fields. It's very clear that the sides of, of the sinkhole would collapse and large blocks would just run out across it. And we have quite a few of those things. Sometimes there's bones right, right up on those things quite a bit. And um, I'm bad about this. I keep having this imagination, this redneck moment where you know, Billy the rhinoceros goes out on the edge and says to his mates, look at this, right? And they all go out and the door goes down. Um, so uh, it's Tennessee, you know it's happened. You've got to, you know, it's just the way it is. Um, but this is you know, very well laminated all the way down. And uh, look at the scale here. This is only the superficial stuff. We're not talking about the coring and the other not 40 metres on this. Um, the gravel alluvium buff coloured oxidised thing on the top um, doesn't get much love, but it's actually really important for the site. Uh, it's an erosional cap protector, if you will. Right? If that gravel wasn't there, chances are most of the site would have been gone. Right? And we, need, you know, we know a little of that, and the site was a hill. And the reason it was a hill is because that gravel's on top protecting the clays underneath. So when you think about it, we start with a sinkhole, and the current topography is a hill. We have what's called a you know, classic example of inverted topography, where you know, the erosional right, protection uh, allowed this to survive and we have the valley developing down the site in the carbonates. So, you know, God bless the gravel, we wouldn't have a fossil site. Okay, um, once TDOT went off, and they drilled a total of 43 holes, 38 of them had something to say, a couple of them just didn't go anywhere, weren't real useful. Um, they gave us some idea of the distribution of the site. Um, this is a contour map, I'm just using this as an overlay basically, but this is based on their drill holes, um, this is a, a, a contour of what the bottom of the site would look like. Right? And you know, obviously what it's saying is there's at least one good deep point over here, there's another one over here, and there's a couple of others that you can see there. Um, it's very coarse, why? Because we only had 38 holes that had anything to say. Um, only about 22 actually went down to refusal. Right, so sometimes they're drilling in the orange clay, they're like, eh, we're not hitting anything, we're done, they move on. Right? So um, if you give a computer a set of drill holes and tell it to contour it, right, it it'll do it for you, no problems. It's just what you get out of it is, is the issue. So let's just say this is a good start, but it's, it's you know, coarse, to put it mildly. Um, but the other two things that have happened at the site since then in terms of trying to figure out the structure was UT came in, so the Knoxville folks came in um, in the early days. I had very little interaction with them. I got here in 03. So they had come, um, they lost, they left basically. Right? They, were, they expected to get the site for their own research at, at that point um, and it, it just didn't play out that way so they basically went away. But they did dig a trench, right? It was the old uh, swamp pond, the frog pond in front of the large boulder, and they also put a small core in there. Um, I've never seen that core, and I'm not sure how much of it still exists. Um, and then when I came in, they gave me some startup money, so I had a core drilled as well. I went for the deepest point that was known uh, on the site based on you know, what information we had at the time. Right. So this is the UT stuff, All right? So they got themselves a little drill rig in there and they did that, and again, here's our boulder. Um, um, and um, they uh, managed to get down, I think it was about 15 meters. So they certainly didn't get to the bottom, um, but they got a little stuff out of there. And then they also came in and did this as well, right? So they got in there and just chewed it up. 
and I've never really seen any information, any results from any of that. Right? Um, so um, Aaron Shunk was a master's student. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers Aaron. Some of the old people will. I'm using old people in the kindest possible terms. Right? <laughs> so, um, but Aaron came and did a master's. He worked on some of that core material and he also had surface samples. Um, and uh, yeah, he did some of the work describing that. But, um, basically his master's thesis was, was what's, what's eventuated from that. Um, in 04, I had a rig come in. Um, this is basically under the annex now. It's right the far side of it. Um, and uh, we uh, got a call that went down 120 feet, 119.3 feet eventually, um, to basement. So we got all the way down. Um, and uh, this is what the core looks like. Um, so this, this is brought up. Um, and then um, basically use a cheese cutter, I added just a piece of piano wire, well it's a guitar string actually, to go down and cut the core, it's that soft most of the time. And we could split it in half so you could see the layering in it. And again, you know, take home message, it's very, very finely laminated. Um, I will tell you that there was, there's a lot of trouble with the core, it had, um, the rig had trouble drilling this stuff. Um, when it would come up, it was, had the consistency of silly putty, and it was actually steaming when it came up. The amount of friction that clay generated right, right, killed the rig a couple of times. Right. Um, so we had issues with that. Um, so we lost a little bit of coal. When it kills the rig, the water would get in the hole. And then when the rig tried to drill down again, what's it doing to that, that clay at the surface? Right. It's putting it in a blender. Right. So we have some, some parts of the core we lost that way. Um, the other thing I didn't know was because they had so much trouble getting out, they had to turn the right to pull it out. And you've probably had the same trouble. Anybody done some drilling in wood and the drill bit stuck and you kind of got to turn and wiggle and do all the stuff at the same time, right? Well, what's it doing to the clay? And so we, we got the core. I didn't know what was going on with all these lines and they change angle or they change depth. And it's, I still really don't have a good answer for that. It's one of the things I've always been leery about this core is the angles change a lot. Some of it's very clearly rotation of the core bit doing it. Some of it's not. All right. Um, so here's a uh, length of the core down about 86 feet. Um, it would come up in a five foot tube, which is two and a, two, two and a half foot sections. Um, and um, this is why I can say that some of the dip and change is probably not, because look at this end. It's going that way, and you get down to this end, it's going the other way. Right, so there's changes of slope in the deposition of this material, right? And you know, it's got to be real. Some of it's quite common. Um, characteristics of these things, very fine grain. You can see there are these orange bands occasionally. Those tend to correspond to coarser grains. Um, if I'm being kind, right, fine grain sands. And some of them are literally sand grains. Uh, but they show up as orange. I suspect you're getting a little bit more water through and you're getting some more oxidation of whatever iron may have been in this. Right? The dark bands are organic rich uh, and then we have, you can see these subtle changes in light in, in, the, in the shading of these things and that's because of the different grain sizes that you clay in your silk grains on these puppies. Right. Okay. When, when you're not sure what to do, you always go back home to mum. Um, I used to be a paleomagnetist a long time ago, so one of the first things I try to do is to look at the magnetic uh, behaviour of the core. Um, NRM is the natural remnant magnetization, which means how much right, magnetism is in the sample. Um, and when I ran the core, um, and this is including the, the core starts here, this is, these are surface samples. Um, Bottom line is I was just looking to see if there was anything magnetic in what I was saying. And we have these spikes that would show up in here. Um, so take home message, we have influxes of material bringing iron in and it's concentrated there. Out of that are you making the iron in situ in those sands. Right, that's another possibility. But it seems to be telling me that we have pulses of sediment coming in. Some of them are a little bit enriched. Um, each one of those spikes corresponds to one of these orange things. Again, this is a blow up of the same piece of core. And again, you can see the shading is a little bit more obvious than this. All right, magnetic susceptibility is another game you can play. But again, take home message. 
Um, this is basically the magnetizability of, of the, the sample that you have in the machine. Um, it's showing the presence of, of increased amounts of iron in some places. Right. So, um, all right, so put all that together, um, and the first best guess that came up for the origin of the site, well, it's a sinkhole. We're in carbonate cast area, we've got lake sediments, got to make a hole somewhere, let's call it a sinkhole. So we had, you know, basically a feature developed with some sort of a collapse to it, and then that was plugged at the bottom somehow, long enough that we had water in this thing. Um, we had lake sediments, and then that provided effectively a, something to attract animals and or trap the animals here, and you end up with the, the site, right? And that, that was basically the sales pitch in the early days. And you've all seen this picture out there somewhere. Everybody fat, dumb, and happy, right? And uh, ready to take a swim, right? Steep walled features around the side as well. Um, I wanted to throw this out there. Um, a lot of the grad students uh, have gone down to Florida to Gainesville um, for you know, the purposes of doing research at UF. Um, just outside, well, it's in the northwest corner of the town of Gainesville, is the Devil's Mill Hopper. Right? Um, when I was a, a grad student at Florida, this was the go to geologic site because it was the only hole in the area. All right? And so you had to go there. It actually had some hard rocks in it too, which is quite exciting for Florida. It's all made of kitty litter everywhere else. Um, but it's a big sinkhole. And I wanted to just throw it out. These are some, some images of it. It has um, you know, access down this boardwalk. Um, and again, if people wanted to practice mountain climbing, they go to the Devil's Mill Hopper and do the stairs. I mean, you, that's what the, you know, I'm going to go hike the Appalachian Trail, and this is where I'm going to practice. All right. um, but um, it also has uh, springs coming into it. Um, and a semi-permanent lake at the bottom. Um, nicely forested, and if you wanted to try to imagine a rough equivalent for what the, the grey site might have been like, this is the best thing I can come up with for that. It's a big sinkhole. Unfortunately, it's real difficult to get a good scale picture to show you the whole shooting match because of that. Um, so this is um, another sinkhole that's not that far from it. Um, but again, it gives you the general idea. Steep walls, body of water in the middle, obviously a smaller scale. Right, the rhinoceros had bikinis on, stuff like that. Imagine that, we'd be good for the site. Um, but, you know, I think this, there are analogues down in Florida that are worth looking at because of that. Right. Um, the springs are pretty active here. I will say most of the time the water level would not change that much. Um, and that's something else to think about in that, yeah, we're putting water into the system, but the water's going out of the system too. Right, there's plumbing underneath the Devil's Mill Hopper. And um, you know, I'm pretty sure we got plumbing underneath the site here as well. Okay, so let's look at the Gray site in a little bit more detail. So what's the geologic nature of the, of the uh, site itself? Um, and how can we kind of figure out what's going on? And I, what I want to do is try to make a case that there are structural controls for the site. Right, so bedrock, again, this is just the, uh, the same satellite image. I just sort of did a quick doodle, so you got the site centered. Um, there are two um, major rock formations in the area. Right, we have um, the Knox group, um, sometimes called, the formation locally is a Jonesboro limestone for the most part, but there are other formations within the Knox group. It's difficult to separate it here. If you go down to where it's named, which is Knox County and Knoxville, there are multiple formation names down there. So on average, in most geologic maps, you're going to see it called the Knox Group. Um, I, it's carbonates. Um, I use the term limestone here because I figured I have people from the public in here and with, with some excuses, some of it's limestone, but a lot of it's dolomite. And if you look at the T-dot map, they'll call it the Knox Dolomite. All right, difference between the two, right? The chemical formula for limestone is CaCO3. Right? Chemical formula for dolomite is Ca slash Mg, right? CO3. Right? So some magnesium substitutes for the calcium makes the rock a little harder, a little more crystalline normally. It resists the traditional test, which is putting hydrochloric acid on it to see if it'll fizz. Um, the bottom line, if you wanted to be a dolomite, it has to have 50% or more calcium, I'm sorry, magnesium versus the calcium. 
Um, so if you go out and look at the rocks around here and put acid on, they actually fizz pretty readily. So um, one thing I'll, I'll say right up front is the geologists who did the original work at the site all came from Knoxville or even Chattanooga, all right? And they brought their names with them, all right? And so you'll see, I'm going to talk about a layer of shale over here. And on the geologic maps that they made, it's the Athens shale. If you look locally, it's the severe shale. And it's the same thing coming from different places. It's, right, so be aware that the names change, but we're talking about the same rock. That's just the way it is. Right, if you potter around in the fields around the site, you can find teeny tiny outcrops of the limestone. You know, this size is about standard. This, this guy was actually coming from, uh, let's see, it's that one there. Um, there's not a lot, but it's definitely there. And uh, I run a field methods class, and one of the first little mapping exercises they have to do is doodle around the area and figure out where these are and measure them up. Makes a good intro exercise. Right. So the site's surrounded by the carbonate. If you go just a little further away uh, up the hill here, and there's a little ridge, um, you'll run into the severe shale. Right? Um, it's the ridge former because it's a shale. Although it's a softer rock than limestone, right, it doesn't dissolve in the rain as much. And so by default, it ends up making the ridges locally. Down in Johnson City, that makes the knobs, as they call them here and there. Right? So we have two different rock formations in the area. This is a close-up of this guy. Um, it's a nice sequence. Uh, we've got relatively crystalline limestone up here. See, it's all mottled down here. Um, there's lots of worm burrows in these things. So it's bioturbated, very shallow marine limestone. If you get up close, there's also there are pebbles in this one. So it's been overturned. Storm deposits have been generated in these as well. All right. The severe shale, that's as good as it gets. All right. Um, and uh, it, once exposed, it breaks up. One thing, I don't know if you can see these lines going through here, um, and th th it's almost vertical. You go up on the ridge, this stuff has been turned up and it's almost right, standing on its edge, all right? Most sedimentary rocks, if they're behaving themselves, should be lying flat unless something's happened to them, all right? These things have been turned a lot. Um, you can see this one, if you go down 75, just past the school, you've got the bend in the road, um, there's a little exposure right there. You have to be quick because the gentleman who owns the land, this is on the road, so it's legal, but the, the land that he owns, um, he's not very happy about us. So I have to do ra rapid drive-bys with students when we do that one. <laughs> All right. But once you get into the curve, you can follow it down there and get killed at the same time with traffic. Uh, this is the better safe exposure. Right. Um, this is the stuff the general shell goes after when they were making bricks. All right. So the age of these guys is uh, the Knox group is Cambro Ordovician, the severe shale is Ordovician. So that's based on trilobites and other critters that you can find in these things. Um, to put that in context, um, these things were deposited on a nice quiet platform. We then had the Appalachian orogeny, uh, orogenies, um, and the, the main hit for our part of the world is called the Allegheny, and it occurred around about in here. Right? And of course, the grey fossil site you know, is way, way, way up here. Um, one other thing to mention, I always try to do this with time scales, is that time scales are never to scale. So be aware that this is compressed. We have another, right, four billion years of Earth history down in here. So, um, you know, this is 500 million years, this is five million years. So really, if this was to scale and this was accurate, right, that little arrow should be way up the top in here. So I'm trying to say is the grey fossil site is a young pup of the area by far, right? So the Knox group rocks are a hundred times older. Right. Here's the geologic map. This is the East Tennessee sheet. And this is the one I rub my students' faces in all the time. Um, so uh, done by Hardeman in 66. Um, and even though it's 50 years old, those guys were good. They've done a very, very good job with this. Uh, when I do my little field trips, I can take students to a smaller region and sometimes we find something they missed, but very rarely. These guys are pretty much on the money. And that X marks the fossil site. Um, OCK, the OC stands for Ordovician Cambrian, K for Knox. So the Knox group is right on the edge of Ordovician Cambrian age. Um, it's the most common of the carbonates or lime rocks in, in this part of the world. Um, and then this little pink thing in here is a little finger of the severe shale. 
Right. Um, if you go down 75, uh, down in here, you'll see there's actually a quarry on the left. Um, and um, various people have owned it. It's so small it hasn't done too much good, but it does exist. Here's a blow up again of the east um, that was done by the geologist from uh, Chattanooga when they first got here. Um, and here's the, uh, the shale that's severe. Now it's the Athens shale because that's what they know. So they use their names instead of our names. That's what you get when you had tourists coming into an area. All right. And then we have the knocks around it. And this T is for tertiary, right, for the fossil site. Right. So what I want you to start seeing on this is that the site is on the edge of a structure, and this is a large fold. Right. Uh, um, since I make everybody get the buttons out and measure dip and strike on rocks, here are the dip and strikes for the limestones in our part of the world. So all the rocks are dipping towards 75, right, in the carbonates around here, give or take 25, 30 degrees. Right, and that continues across, right, and up onto these roads until you get to the severe, uh, and then when you get on this side, they start to dip the other way. And um, this is a severe shale. It doesn't make it all the way across. This is actually could be extended a little bit more. We found shale in people's backyards. I have to knock on doors and ask all the time. Some people are user friendly and some are not. Right. But, okay, the other thing I'm going to say is if you have rocks that have been folded, um, if you have them in the correct order, begin with oldest at the bottom, youngest at the top, if you fold them down like that and then erode them, you should have the youngest one in the middle, oldest one on the outside. Right. So we have the younger Ordovician severe surrounded by the older right, knocks. That says we have a syncline, a U-shaped fold here. Right, so this is the uh, intro level slide we use when we're trying to talk about folds in class. Um, if you could take a knife and kind of cut through the layering, you can imagine the fossil site, here's our severe shale in the U-shaped syncline, a little bit of limestone on the side, and here's the fossil site on one side or one limb of the fold. Right, okay. Um, if you fold rocks, you're going to create cracks and fractures, particularly in rocks like limestone that are mechanically kind of tough. Shale will respond to bending by just warping, for the most part. But rocks um, that are really mechanically solid will resist that, and the result is they break. Right, so we've got to talk about joints. Right, is everybody familiar with the idea of a joint? Yeah, and we'll... I, I, I Googled up to find an image and this popped up, so I said, yeah, I've got to do this. So, right, it's not that kind of joint. All right? All right. Joints are a mechanical response to stress in rocks that, you know, again, just too hard to, to flex. Um, and they can develop a series of fractures. And the definition of this joint is a fracture that, where there's been no displacement, no movement on either side. So it's just a crack that's developed. If the blocks on either side move, you've got yourself a fault. Right? But the important thing is you've got the cracks. This is an aerial view um, of, of a sequence of sandstones, again, mechanically kind of tough rock, and you know, it resisted the stress to the point it lost out and started fracturing up. Right? Think plumbing system. Right? You start making lots of cracks and fractures, and you get water into these things, and then you, you know, if you have limestone rocks, that facilitates dissolution, and that's going to help make cave structured features and ultimately cast sinkhole collapse things. Right, so I'm going to try to sell you on the idea that we have joint control at the grey fossil site. Right. Um, this is another figure trying to show that you know, joints are very, very uh, clearly related to the folds that occur with rocks. So very commonly you'll find joints running at sets, right, pairs of them, uh, and especially perpendicular or parallel to the direction of the folding. Right, um, this is uh, another figure trying to show the same thing where this rock has been flexed, the joints are developed. The only problem is the figure was at an anticline and we have to have a U-shaped one, so imagine this going that way. Um, but, you know, we've got a good plumbing system with these rocks under here. Right, um, I can make the case that this does work locally um, we get a lot of calls in the department for people who have a sinkhole problem. Um, and the first thing I'll do is, if they give me their address, I'll look up their place and get out the topographic map. And oftentimes you'll see a line of sinkholes, 
right? And their place is the next one along. And it's like, congratulations, you're now the next sinkhole, right? So these things will occur in, in sets and they are related to each other because the plumbing's connected underground. All right, so um, back to our, to this is our topographic map for the site. Um, and again, I think you've got it all down now. This is the main ridge, here's our little hill, right? And the rhino pit's in here, along with the boulder. Um, this is the contour map we could come up with based on um, the T-dot augers, and that wasn't satisfactory. So we needed to try to find another way of figuring out what was going on. Um, you know, coring costs a lot, uh, and so one other thing we thought we'd have a crack at was doing a gravity survey at the site, right? And by the bottom line is that every th object with mass has a gravitational attraction, right? So if you go out tonight and you're not having any luck picking up anybody, you have gravitational attraction going for you, if nothing else, and if you can't do it, it's your problem after that, <laughs> all right? And, um, and on a global scale, we have gravity where you have large masses of rock. So the Andes, right, big mountain range, has gravity associated with it. So for the grey side, there's a little more subtle idea. We've got dense, thick limestones in the area. They have, quotes, a high gravity, at least compared to the, the clay fill in the site. It's not really well compacted, right? So it has a low density. So we were like thinking, okay, if we could take a gravity meter and take it across the site, right? We could check out, right, the differences in gravity and create a map from that. And then we could use that as a proxy for depth to the bottom where the denser rocks are, how much fill we have, basically. Right, so um, my wife and I got going on this one. Um, my wife, uh, Julie, was a uh, uh, seismologist, but she did gravity and magnetics work as well as geophysics for her master's uh, thesis. And uh, so we managed to borrow a gravity meter. It's this long cylinder here. Um, and you know, you tell people it's a gravity meter, they say, well, what's it do? It's like, well, oh, okay, it measures gravity, all right? Uh, the way it does it, it has a spring with a weight on it. It's really all it is. Right? And right, the Earth's right, mass attracts that weight. So if we have dense rocks underneath, it's going to stretch that spring a bit more. If we have less dense rocks because we've got the clay fill, less stretch. Right? And that, that's a, you know, a very great simplification of what's going on, but it'll, it'll do. So what we did is we took the gravity meter um, and every 10 meters across the entire site, and that means actually from the power line right on the other property across to the car park on the church side and from basically where the road is now all the way down about 80 almost 100 yards past the turnaround at the back of the site we did a measurement right within the site itself we did it every five meters right so we ended up doing 1400 measurements right for this um, something else is uh, you know gravity is affected by mass so if you're on a slope Right, you've got the hillside has its own gravitational attraction too, so you have to allow for that. Um, so for that, you have to do a measurement around it as well. We had to do uh, terrain corrections, and uh, we did 12 terrain corrections for every one of the other measurements that was done. So it took several years to, to gather the data for this. Right. Um, but the bottom line is we ended up getting a, a map that looked like this. So this is a map where basically all the other influences have been taken out except you know, effectively the difference between the limestone rock and how close it is to the surface and the fill. Right. Okay, bottom line, give or take, the purple blue is where the fill dominates. Right. The lighter colours, the reds and oranges, is actually where we have limestone on the surface. Right. So when you look at this, the first thing to see is that this is not a simple single sinkhole that's a cone shape. Right. It has an elongate pattern to it, right? and there are multiple other places that we, you know, we have multiple highs and lows on this thing. So the topography on the bottom of the hole is complex, right? and that becomes very, very important. All right. um, the, the, the line that it's taking, right? remember the folded rocks are kind of running this way. This is running perpendicular to that, and that's exactly what you expect for joint structures. So it makes perfect sense that that's going on there. All right. Um, you can kind of do slices across these things, run a program, um, and try to get an idea what the topography would look like. 
Um, and this literally is a block right, diagram of what we think is happening. Um, we're assuming the Knox dolomite, what's been called there, is 2.77 grams per cc. Um, that's the density of that material effectively, at least it's, it's um, how we're going to figure that. And uh, we know that because we have cores, we, we actually right, you got those numbers. Um, look at the fill dirt, right? And again, I had core, we had material, we actually measured the density of this. So this really is what made, made us, uh, you know, allowed us to do this job as we had a big difference in density in this material. But take home message is that you have fill and then you have high points and you have fill again. So again, it's not a simple single hole, you know, it's complex. And this is the second line. Right, so line two in there, same story. And then we have right, line down the long line as well. And again, same story. So take home message, there are multiple sinkholes here. Right. Okay. Um, and again, I'm going to you know, say that you know, the, the orientation of these, the fact that we've got multiple sinkholes, um, is that we have these fracture patterns, joints developed in the rocks. Um, not only are you know, they on the surface, they go all the way down through the sequence. And so water has been controlled in this and there's a plumbing system. And that's what's creating the sinkholes that we have. Um, I will say there's another story with the Fulkersons. Um, never got to prove this one. Um, but um, John Chambers, who's right, one of the sons, um, had stories about fishing for blind white, uh, white fish in the valley down there. Uh, now we did the survey all the way across that and didn't find any evidence for that. But we didn't have any great reason to lie about that one. But they're saying that they, they could actually pull fish out of a hole in the ground. Right? Uh, the implication being there's a lot more plumbing there. Um, we know there are caves in the area. If you go to the back of the site, go past the school and go towards the ridge, um, there are people there and there are caves there. I've been in one. Um, they've, I've been told about a neighbour who's got another one and it's so big that you'll see Chinamen coming out of it on a regular basis. Um, and that's always the story when people have caves. Um, but I've not been able to, to uh, right, get access to that and confirm. But we know there's plenty of, of you know, cast and cave features in the area. All right. So um, back to this core. That was drilled at the deepest point of the site. Um, and one thing that was, was going to be, it was an issue, was that it was oxidized at the top. Um, because we want to do some work on this thing. And um, Aaron Shunk had worked on the UTK core, and we got together. Um, and Aaron did some chemistry where he was looking at um, uh, isotopes of carbon and carbon nitrogen ratios and oxygen isotope work. And Aaron and I had talked for a while and he kind of was wondering about me and I was wondering about him. Um, because when we talked about this stuff, we, we seemed to be comparing apples and oranges all the time. Um, and sure enough, when we started looking at the chemistry of these things, um, we found that what he'd been looking at and what I was looking at, um, you know, the, the, the tracks are different. The signatures off these things are different. Um, and so we had a problem. And for a long time, the question was whether you know, Aaron had actually done the chemistry right. And at the same time, we also had another little piece of joy. Um, Mike Zavada and Mohamed Zobo had taken some pollen samples from the GFS1 core um, and they started getting pollen out of it um, and uh, they found that some of the pollen right, indicated Paleocene to Eocene age and in fact Mike Zavada went around for a little while and basically was, was telling people that the, you know, the vertebrate paleontologists didn't know what they were doing yeah. which may be true but we'll, we'll not go there um, <laughs> But there was an age difference. Um, and so we had this issue uh, with, with this. And um, between that and talking to Aaron, um, and then with the structure of the site, um, it became obvious that we had to resolve a big problem. We had fossil pollen uh, in my core, and this starts at about 12 meters depth and goes down. Right? The reason it starts there is because the top of the core is oxidized. Right? So it's, it's, and that kills pollen, it destroys it. So there's no sampling at the top, and that's very unfortunate. 
However, you get down into in, in around about 20 metres, we've got good quality pollen coming out. Not a lot of it, but it's there. But the indication is the age, right, is right, Paleocene Eocene, right? And that's not compatible with the vertebrates on the surface, to put it mildly. Right, so we end up with this situation, right? Something coming out of the core is old, right? And the vertebrates, and it's old being 45, maybe 50 million years. Um, and then the vertebrates saying a very, very different age, right? Um, and the argument was who was right, and the solution to that is probably that you're both right, right? So the shunk location was over there, and Aaron had looked at that, no question it was Miocene. Deanna Ochoa's pollen work also saying Miocene, or the vertebrates saying Miocene, right? So we have one age for that, and then the core, I chose the deepest point in the site to have a crack at, um, and it looks like we may have drilled into something that's paleogene in age. So we have a complex structure, right? Multiple sinkholes forming, and here's the trick, you don't have to require all the sinkholes to form at the same time, right? So a sinkhole is formed, it's filled up, right? In paleogene age, and then a second sinkhole filled, uh, perhaps a bigger one, or the whole structure just you know, grew larger and overlapped. And so we have something like this scenario where this is our paleogene sinkhole doing its thing, a new hole formed, and then this actually formed and widened. And we know we've got some of the clays over the top overlapping these things that are the Miocene stuff. So we have one on top of another, right? Um, this is not an unusual situation in cast areas. If you have exp carbonates exposed long enough, the plumbing systems get complex. Um, there's a great site in northern Australia where there's a large number of carbonate units that have been dissolved and you see Pleistocene fossil age deposits, you know, about a thousand feet depth, they're way, 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 way down. And then you have other things that are much older, higher up. Everything gets out of order. So this is not a thing that, that you know, hasn't happened before. All right, so, okay, if we have at least two fossil sites, the next question is, all right, how many more have we got, right? What we really need to do is target all of these places Right, and drill each one of them and see how many fossil sites we can find at the great fossil site. It's really what it comes down to. All right. Um, we had the new building made, the annex. Um, the plot thing is a little bit there. There are units exposed here. And this is just saying that, you know, we have a variation in the stratigraphy across the surface. And I'm just going to point these out because I don't want to go too much longer. Um, the, the annex foundations from north to south. When you have a look at these puppies, right, there's dramatic changes in the uh, sediment types as you go from one to the other. At the north end, it's a relatively massive clay. Doesn't show the laminations very well. Right, there are gravel stringers in there. Right, you go to the middle of the site, you have well laminated clays, and I would say, quotes regulation like I was getting out of the core. Right, well defined. Um, uh, organic rich units, there's times it's dipping, right? Over the top, you have a sand sitting on top of this thing there. Right, that's a close-up of that one. Not unlike what we're pulling out of the core, basically in the same area, so I'm not surprised, right? And we have a sand overlaying top. So we have changes in what's going on in the sediment, sedimentary regime in this thing. Right, when you go to the far corner, it gets even more interesting. This sucker is dipping at a huge angle, it's 35 degrees. Right. So, not know what's happening there either. I suspect one thing that is happening, if you have a sinkhole, one, you've got very steep sediments, you know, slopes. Sediments are coming in and they're stacking this way. Well, if you have another creek coming on this side, it's going to be stacking another way. So you change angle. The other thing I think is happening is if you have a sinkhole with plumbing underneath, you keep flushing sediment out from underneath. What's going to happen to those sediments? Right, they're going to settle. So I think you have multiple things going on. So um, the complication with the core we already have is I know that they did a lot of damage and you know, a lot of deformation of the core for the drilling process. So the model of that story is we have to have a different drilling process next time. Right. And there, here's the problem. There is a, such a beast. There's a vibra core and it'll push down like that. It won't rotate. Right. It'll penetrate the sediments that way. So what it'll do is compress the core that way, but it won't spin it and rotate it that way. That means you've got to do both, right? And the other problem with the Viber core is it will only go 60 feet. It will not go to the bottom, right? 
Uh, so if we want to go to the bottom, we've got to do the rotary rig. So we're going to have to do two cores in the same place and compare them so that we know what's happening to the core. And then we'll know the deformation, what's real and what's not real, what's artificial. All right. OK, and then the other question, how much digging is left at Gray? All right. So that's a fine example of a Wally. All right. And most people know Wally is a site paleontologist um, and, uh, and part of the panda. Um, and I, when I'm working out here, particularly government school, and you have people doing uh, tours and things, what somebody in the public always asks is like, well, how long are you going to work out here? Um, and Wally's stock answer has been, you know, we, we, we've, if we're lucky, we've done 1% of the site. Um, and other people I've heard say, well, we're going to dig for at least 100 years. And so I thought, what the hell, I've got the envelope out. The length of the site, the longest length we have along the long axis is about 220 metres. Greatest width about 180. We know about 40 metres from the drill core, and that's not counting what's on top. So I said, okay, you know, I'm telling you it's not a single simple sinkhole, and it's not just a simple cone, and I admit I'm using a cone, all right? I'm doing simple math here, okay? But if you assume that the Gray Fossil Site is a simple cone with those sorts of dimensions, then you can come up with a magic number of 414,690 cubic metres of dirt in the site. Okay, we're not allowing for the steepness of the walls. We're not allowing for the fact that actually, if it was steeper and it's, it's large like that, that this is absolutely a minimum number. Right? We, have, we have a wider bottom than that. Right? Um, we're not allowing for the other 10 metres of loose change that's on top. Right? Whatever else might have been eroded. And we haven't allowed for topography, which is going to add and take in some places. All right? So, then I called up and talked to a few people and said, well, how much dirt have we got out of the site? All right, and the answer was, huh, <laughs> don't know. <All> right? <laughs> right? So I kind of imagined the pits, and actually I'm going to get Governor's School out to, uh, this summer to measure everything. It's going to be one of their little jobs. Right? But um, being generous to all the, the people who were sweated out there, I figured on 300 cubic metres of material has been removed over basically 12 years of activity at the site. So if you do the math on that, right, folks working out here, roughly speaking, are moving 25 cubic metres a year. Right? So, and again, okay, how long are we going to do it? 100 years? Well, Wally's 1% number. Right? <laughs> right. Right. I thought the 0 0.6 was important. All right? So now you have a real answer for people. All right? So the conclusions, multiple holes. Right? Lots of fossil sites and lots of work to get done. So um, let's go back to the early days. I wouldn't show this to Wally either. This would, when I was out here doing the gravity survey, the boys out here with their trucks. <laughs> All right. So, so uh, anyway, anybody got any questions? So, yes, sir.